Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from Evanston. On the show tonight, simulating the spread of the coronavirus as Chicago reopens. What to expect at this weekend's virtual graduation for Chicago's high school seniors. How to survive allergy season. Touring a historic local art collection. Plus, our Chicago portrait series focuses on local performer Milani Ninja. But first, Brandis, I'm co-anchoring tonight from Evanston as about 200 community residents get together for a discussion about police community relations here in this town. We'll have the latest on that and how Evanston is rebuilding from the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, we toss it back to you. Looking forward to it, Paris. Thank you. The Chicago Police Department may have another scandal on its hands. Images from inside the office of U.S. Congressman Bobby Rush show more than a dozen CPD officers lounging, sleeping, and helping themselves to some snacks. These pictures were taken on May 31st and June 1st by video surveillance at Rush's campaign office at 55th and Wentworth, while nearby businesses were being vandalized and burglarized as unrest spread throughout the city. They even had the unmitigated gall to go and make coffee for themselves and to pop popcorn, my popcorn, in my microwave while looters were tearing apart businesses within their sight, within their reach. A visibly angry Mayor Lori Lightfoot vowed to reform the police department by revising the contract with the Fraternal Order of Police and drafting legislation requiring officers to be licensed by the state. The officers, which included three supervisors, have not yet been officially identified by CPD officials. Lightfoot says they could face criminal charges. Restaurants looking to open up for patio dining could be getting some relief from the city. The plan would fast track outdoor dining applications from restaurants and cafes. The city council will vote next week on a measure that allows the Office of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection to approve sidewalk permits without going through city council first. That could shave 30 days off the permit process. The measure also reduces the cost of the permits by 75%. The state's public health department says there have been 91 additional fatalities related to COVID-19 since yesterday, bringing the statewide death toll to 6,185. In addition, there are more than 700 new cases, bringing the total case count to over 130,000. But as coronavirus cases are on the rise in other states, the U.S. stock market had its worst day since March. The Dow plunged about 7% today and the S&P 500 dropped nearly 6%. This drop came even as many businesses reopen across the country and as the number of Americans filing for first-time unemployment declined again in the most recent week. Community leaders are gathering in a park just to Chicago's north to have a, dis a frank discussion tonight, as we just heard Paris mention. The city of Evanston is Chicago's nearest north suburb and has a population around 75,000 people. Paris Schutz has been reporting from the North Shore community, which is more diverse by demographics and income than some of its neighbors. He joins us now in Mason Park, where organizers are holding a rally to talk about the issue of defunding the police. Paris. Yeah, Brennis, it's billed as a discussion about that subject and even abolishing the police. And this is how it's done in Evanston. Close to 200 residents here broken down into smaller circles ha talking about their experiences with the police and their ideas for reform in this community. It's an event tonight organized by a group called Evanston Fight for Black Lives. And what they say is Evanston is more progressive with its approach to policing than many neighboring communities like Chicago. But organizers say they want public officials to hear their demands because they say there is still work to be done here. There are some communities in Evanston that um, have grown up in that ha have, are existing without the presence of police, but the reality of it is, is there's a lot of neighborhoods in Evanston that um, have a high police presence in their communities and um, still have a negative type of relationship with police in Evanston. Um, so while Evanston is really forward thinking, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I hope that tonight we can come together as a community and really think about what needs to be done exactly so we can create tangible demands to present to our city council and to our mayor. 
And Evanston Police Chief Demetrius Cook says that the department has for decades practiced a more community oriented approach to policing and that the 100 plus police officers on the force demographically represent the city's population. And though defund the police sounds like a pretty severe slogan, he says that police agree that there are certain cases perhaps police should not take. It's time for us to really be serious in our community policing efforts. I think we have to have candid conversations uh, and respectful conversations about race relations. If we had more assistance in dealing with mental health issues, uh, domestic violence, you know, those are the things that law enforcement officers uh, respond to a lot. That takes up a lot of our time. I understand uh, we need to help people with mental uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, it, but I do think that some of that could be done by a private entity. And Evanston is known as a progressive North Shore community with a thriving downtown. Of course, it's home to Northwestern University. And despite the tensions here between community and police, city officials say Evanston did not suffer a great deal of property damage early last week, as Chicago did. In fact, the damage was limited to some stores uh, around Howard, which is the north border of Chicago. And city officials say that anyone arrested for vandalism or looting was not from the city of Evanston. That said, businesses have, of course, felt the impact of COVID-19 and the shutdown as the town has emerged with outdoor dining. The city's Chamber of Commerce says it is coming up with some very creative ways to help lift businesses out of the hole. The chamber is going to be doing something that we're going to call Recovery University. And uh, sort of, yes, and sort of, like, are you? And our, our, our call to businesses, are you serious? Like, are you going to serious about coming back? We're going to provide them assistance in business planning, financial planning, as well as a cohort type of support so they can talk to each other and get support about some of their issues. Evanston's also known for its beautiful residential areas. It is diverse demographically, but it does tend to be somewhat segregated. The south part of town has a more lower income population, has higher populations of African American and Hispanic Latino, and the town in general reports 747 COVID positive cases, 58 deaths. One organizer we spoke to says that she started an aid fund for Evanston to help residents with groceries and other needs during the shutdown and says Evanston has followed the trend elsewhere of being harder hit in the low income communities. These racial disparities have always been there and it's not just across the nation, it's in Evanston. And so it's how can we really elevate and folks have the resources, but how do we really start to share that? And it's not about just throwing money at the problem, but really seeking justice. And once again, we're out here at Mason Park in Evanston. As you see, as many as 200 local residents sitting in circles, talking, having discussions. They say they wanted the mayor to come out and the police chief. They want to interface with city leaders about these discussions, about what kind of policy can come out of this. Now, in just a bit, we will be back with a discussion with Evanston's mayor. And so join us for that and a whole lot more. But first, Brandis, we toss it right back to you. Yeah, Paris, that's a very interesting way of having that discussion there. Thank you. And now to Phil Ponce and how local arts organizations are working to build diversity and inclusion. Phil. Brenda, statements of solidarity with Black Lives Matter and more broadly with the call to undo racism are everywhere, it seems. They are coming from corporations as well as arts organizations across the country, including many performing arts groups here in the city. And skepticism about how much these words of support really mean and what change, if any, has followed. Here in Chicago, one organization, Enrich Chicago, has been working to support arts and culture groups dedicated to building diversity, equity, and inclusion since 2014. And joining us are Nina Sanchez. She is director of Enrich Chicago, Kiana Marshall of Urban Gateways, and Kate Lorenz from the Hyde Park Arts Center. Guests, welcome to Chicago tonight. And first of all, Nina Sanchez, uh, Enrich Chicago, describes itself as addressing systemic racism in arts and culture organizations and in funding. You know, people might think that the last place one would expect to find uh, racism is in arts organizations. Why does Enrich Chicago need to exist? Well, thanks for the question, Phil. I'm glad to be here. Um, you know, the arts and culture, like every aspect of our society, has been touched by systemic racism. It's baked into our country's history. It's built into our institutions and the systems we all live and breathe in. 
Um, the beauty of it is that the arts has given us an incredible set of tools to really tap our imagination, to think about how can we use arts to lead the charge to undo the impacts of racism in our arts and culture sector. And that's precisely how Enriched Chicago came to exist. Uh, Kate Lorenz, you lead a you co-lead a weekly meeting of CEOs from different arts organizations like the Joffrey, Steppenwolf, and uh, philanthropic, philanthropic organizations like the MacArthur Foundation. What are people talking about right now? Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I appreciate being here. Yeah, I do. I co-lead uh, Affinity Space for Executive Directors of Arts Organizations in the City with my partner, Carlos Tortolero from National Museum of Mexican Fine Art. And it's really been a space where we can come together and think about the challenges that we face actually doing the work every day, knowing that a lot of challenges come up along the way. Um, so we talk about everything from um, lately the, um, the, the COVID crisis and the equity implications for that, for our people and our teams and our artists, um, and how we can move forward and make progress together. And uh, how about uh, the issues raised by the uh, killing of George Floyd in, uh, in Minneapolis? What has uh, what that prompted? What kinds of conversations has that prompted? You know, it, it, th we've been having these conversations about um, systemic racism and, uh, you know, violence against black and brown bodies for a long time. Um, so a lot of our conversations have been, how do we support our teams during this time? How can we... Um, use this moment to get wind in the sails and provoke faster change that we're working towards and um, support people who are most impacted by that crisis, which in many cases isn't us in the top of our organizations. K Kiana uh, Marshall, the, uh, the organization uh, in Rich Chicago also organizes affinity spaces for rising arts leaders of color. Uh, what do you see that needs to happen to make sure that there is equity in the arts? Um, what I see that needs to happen um, is that several organizations, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to be transparent. And then we also have to make commitments and stick with them for years to come. I see. And uh, Nina Sanchez, back to you. And Rich Chicago issued their own full page uh, statement last week in the Chicago Tribune stating that uh, your work is to help everyone understand their role in racial justice and acquire the tools needed to move from intention to transformative anti-racist change. What's mm -hmm. changed in the Chicago arts and culture space since the, your members have been working those tools? Yes, well, we're really uh, fortunate to have been in existence for five years now. And in those five years, we've seen a number of changes across our member institutions. We've seen increases in the number of artists of color who are being presented um, within these institutions. We have seen an increase in the representation of people of color on teams. Um, we have also seen changes to funding formulas and funding practices by our philanthropic uh, members um, to the tune of upwards of uh, $5 million in the last two years alone. So we think that there is um, there's a lot that's happening. There's a lot that's still in process. Um, but more important than anything, these institutions have committed to the long term and to building a shared and critical analysis about race and racism across their institutions um, and continue to engage in that learning. Uh, <laughs> Kate Lorenz, one of the uh, one member organization, Victory Gardens Theater, has had their executive director step down following demands from artists who work with the theater that she do so. Uh, she worked with Enriched Chicago for a long time. Can you just give us a bullet point as to what happened there? Yeah, you know, I'm really not on the inside of that situation. Um, you know, I think it's played out very publicly that there were concerns around um, transparency of a leadership succession process. and succession planning and how we think about leadership in the arts, which is an important um, kind of variable in um, racism in the arts and how we think about that transition is something that we as um, organizations and with Enrich's support are, are, always, are kind of thinking through together. Kiana Marshall, one of the things I understand you've been thinking about is how Urban Ga Gateways, which is an organization founded by a black woman, Jesse Woods, and uh, black people dedicated to giving black children in the city exposure and training in the arts, uh, it, it's now predominantly white in leadership and in its uh, staff. How does that conversation play out at work? 
Um, I think that conversation plays out at work is that um, we as an organization, we just have to do more research. Um, we have to probably hire people who are professional when it comes to digging up uh, history to learn more about Jesse Woods and the other people of color who founded the organization. Um, I personally believe that it's extremely important that we keep that um, at the front to let people know that it was founded by people of color because if we never speak about it, that history gets lost. I see. Nina Sanchez, uh, last year your organization published a study of philanthropic spending by foundations in the Chicago area on arts and culture. and It was titled A Portrait of Inequity, Measuring Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in Chicago's Arts and Culture Community. Uh, what, what did that... Uh, what did that study find? Uh, for example, one of the things we noticed was that uh, uh, one of the revelations was that arts organizations led by persons of color receive 50 cents for every dollar received by traditional white arts organizations from the city's philanthropic community. Is that improving? Um, it is, you know, one of the um, calls to action coming out of that, that publication is to revisit the, the research questions to understand how much has that, that needle moved in the direction we need it to move? Um, the, what we uncovered in Chicago is not unlike what we're seeing across the country. There have been other major national publications around the same question. Um, and this is actually the first and only study that pertains to Chicago specifically. And so we're encouraged by what we have seen through our organizing work in terms of changes um, being made by our foundation partners. We're encouraged by what we see in the response to COVID relief in the arts and culture sector as a process that has been framed and carried out through the lens of racial equity as a principle for continued work for bringing greater equity to those funding processes. Kate Lawrence, last question for, uh, for you, and that is uh, you've been working diligently, this organization, I understand, for the past four years. How, how do you know when your work is done? <laughs> You know, Phil, that's a that's a great question, and it's it's never done. Um, I think that I, one of the reflections that we were just talking about with our board and staff is that one of the realities of this work is you you there's not a finish line like a lot of projects that you work on. It's a condition that we're undoing. So um, we can maybe mark progress along the way, but at the end of the day, um, we keep going. Um, so we, we've got a lot a lot more work ahead of us. And Nina Sanchez, Kiana Marshall, and Kate Lorenz, thank you all very much. We appreciate your insights. And up next, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's reporting live from Evanston. But first, a look at the weather. Still to come on Chicago Tonight. Great leaders don't set out to be leaders. They set out to make a difference. It's never the story of one graduating high school senior, plus what to expect at this weekend's virtual graduation ceremony. A dancing mayor, perhaps? What bad air quality can mean for lung health? An allergist weighs in. As a celebrated West Ridge nonprofit looks to expand, preservationists try to save a historic building next door. A supercomputer simulates what could happen as the city reopens, if people follow the guidelines, and if they don't. Exploring a historic art collection at a Chicago club filled with history. And in the latest installment of Chicago Portrait, we introduce you to Milani Ninja. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring from just over the Chicago border in north suburban Evanston. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brannis. Yeah, we're back here in Mason Park where about 200 residents are sitting and discussing the notion of defunding the police in this community. And earlier today, I interviewed Evanston's mayor, Steve Haggerty, and I began by asking him his reaction to this notion of defunding the police. I've gotten hundreds of emails that have all said defund, defund the police. Um, Christoph in the New York Times had a really good article today, which basically said, if you can get behind, past the words of defund the police, it's about reimagining policing. And if you think about how we use police these days, they do a lot of mental health work, they do a lot of social work, and they're in schools. And can we, you know, reimagine how policing should be? We can't not have the police. There are needs that we have in our community, and I get plenty of emails that say, Mayor, I've got 
a drug dealer lives next door and we need to, to address this issue. So um, I think it's about reimagining the police and, and how that's going to work. And absolutely, there's a commitment in Evanston to look at that. And, and the police chief was even saying, you know, police officers don't want to do things like domestic disputes or, or mental health issues, but they are usually the first ones called on, on those kinds of cases. So what kind of policy do you think uh, Evanston might promote to reimagine that? Well, I mean, I think we would certainly look at what are the different tasks that we have our police doing right now. I mean, we do have our police in schools. There has been a conversation about whether that's appropriate or not to have them in there as resource officers. So I think that's fair game to take a look at. Um, uh, you know, some of the other misdemeanor kind of uh, crimes here, we could take a look at. We've looked at, we've done a whole alternatives to arrest, you know, instead of sending a bunch of young people uh, who have created, you know, certainly not done something they should do, but are in a criminal court and said, hey, can we handle that and adjudicate that here locally? Uh, and so we've done that here in Evanston. So, um, you know, I also think, and I've committed to the Obama Foundation's pledge to look at use of force, and we're going to do a 90-day evaluation of that here in Evanston as, as well. Um, and another thing that you have uh, looked at in Evanston is reparations fund for African-American residents. How does that work? You know, I mean, the reparations fund, we took the cannabis uh, money that just came online here and said the first 10 million of that's going to go into reparations. So we're the first city in the country uh, to create a reparations fund. The hard work is now figuring out how we're going to invest that money. And I think there's a real desire to invest that into the black community in wealth generating areas. So that's housing, that's employment and, and workforce development opportunities, um, it's education. And so those are the areas that we're looking to invest that money. And do you know how much that, that fund might be worth? I mean, altogether, the first $10 million that's generated of cannabis revenue will go into that fund. Uh, we think this year it's going to generate $250,000 in 2020. At the same time, Evanston, like everywhere else, is dealing with the effects of COVID-19 and, and the shutdown. How is the reopening going in Evanston? Yeah, I mean, I think the reopening here, um, both in terms of our retail shops and our restaurants, um, and people getting together and practicing social distancing and wearing masks and all that, I think it's going well. The data here in Evanston continues to look good as we're in this, you know, restore phase right now. We are averaging less than three cases a day on a seven-day moving average. Uh, the percentage of positive cases, uh, and there's still a high number of people being tested here in Evanston. So the test, the number of people tested hasn't gone down. That's you know, 3% as well. So it's below 5%. So we think we've got testing capacity here. For the most part, we think residents are complying with what public health officials are asking us to do in terms of practicing social distancing like we are, wearing your masks, not going out if you're sick. Um, you know, but we can't get complacent. You know, there can be a second wave. There was a second wave back in 1918 when we had a major pandemic. And I worry and many other officials worry about that happening. That's Evanston Mayor Steve Haggerty as we come back here to Mason Park as close to 200 residents here sit and discuss the future of police community relations in this city. And Brandis will be back in just a bit with Evanston's plans for a Juneteenth celebration. But first, we toss it back to you. Thank you, Paris. We'll see you in a bit. Up next, a look at what Chicago has in store this weekend for its public school. Well, actually, all high school graduates. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. It's a rite of passage for high school seniors to walk across a graduation stage in front of friends and family to receive their diplomas. Instead, this Sunday, all Chicago high school seniors are invited to sit down in their living rooms and attend the first ever citywide virtual graduation ceremony. Here to tell us about what to expect is WTTW news reporter Matt Masterson. Hey, Matt. Hey, Brandis. So what's in store for this Sunday? 
Um, so it's a citywide event. It's for all high school seniors who are graduating uh, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, typical graduation ceremonies are sort of off the table this year. So the city decided instead to hold this event um, online or digitally to sort of bring everyone together. Um, they're calling it Graduation 2020 for Chicago by Chicago. And uh, high school seniors from across the city, they can submit what they're calling like a grad walk video of themselves that the city can put into a compilation and include in, during this event on Sunday. Everything gets underway at 1 p.m. on Sunday, and it's going to be streamed online uh, through some of Mary Lori Lightfoot's um, channels, as well as on local channels, including right here on WTTW. Yeah, that's right. And I hear there's going to be some A-list celebrities participating. Who can we expect? Right. So the city had already announced that Oprah Winfrey would be giving the uh, commencement speech and that Hamilton star uh, Miguel Cervantes would be emceeing this event. But on Thursday, they announced a whole slate of other guests and uh, um, people who will be making appearances on Sunday. Uh, that includes some musical performances. Uh, Common will be giving a performance, and there's also going to be uh, athletes from just about every Chicago pro sports team, including the Cubs. There's Chris Bryant and Jason Hayward and Kyle Schwarber from the White Sox. There's Tim Anderson from the Blackhawks. There's Patrick Kane. And there's also going to be players from the Chicago Bears, the Bulls, and the uh, Chicago Sky. And there's also going to be a after show as well that's going to feature some more musical performances. Oh wow, it's a big party. Um, so you also profiled a high school senior. Who is she and how does she feel about graduating amid the pandemic? I did. Uh, her name is Chastity Kasser and she is graduating from uh, Richard T. Crane Medical Preparatory School as its valedictorian this year. Um, this is obviously a unique time for not only seniors but everyone out there, but this high school class is really uh, experiencing something unique and Chastity spoke to me about that about how she realizes that it's not just her going through this, it's not just her school going through this, it's not just her city going through this, it's really everyone. And that these students will really be able to have an ex a shared experience like this that they're going to remember for a really long time. That's right, and uh, you can watch the full ceremony, graduation 2020 for Chicago by Chicago, right here on Channel 11, that's this Sunday at 1 p.m. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And you can read Matt's full story about Chastity Kasser and this year's graduation ceremony on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. As those of us who are accustomed to sniffling, coughing, and sneezing our way through spring and summer already know, we are right in the thick of allergy season. But during a respiratory pandemic, it can be hard to tell if those coughs might signal something more than a high pollen count. Joining us to sort out the symptoms is allergist and immunologist Dr. Juanita Mora of the Chicago Allergy Center. Dr. Mora is also the volunteer national spokesperson for the American Lung Association. Dr. Mora, thank you so much for joining us on Chicago Tonight. My pleasure being with you today. So first, how do allergy symptoms differ from COVID-19 symptoms? So remember, allergy symptoms are going to be typical of what you've had every season. So lots of itchiness itchy eyes, sneezing, a wet cough with phlegm as well too, and sometimes goes along with asthma symptoms, especially when allergies are exacerbated versus COVID-19 or coronavirus that has other symptoms such as loss of smell or loss of taste, a dry cough, shortness of breath, chills and fever. Remember, allergies will not give you fevers. Okay, um, and so there's also some myths that are associated uh, with asthma and COVID-19. So I'll go through those first. Um, myths that allergy medications might make COVID-19 worse, uh, that people with allergies are more susceptible to COVID, and that people using inhalers should stop using them. Um, let's start at the top. Uh, allergy medications might make COVID worse. What do you say to that, that myth? So absolutely not. The thought is, um, as some actual people have thought is, for example, nasal spray have a little bit of steroid in it and people think, well, they might immunosuppress me that might put me at higher risk for COVID-19. But that is not the case. Nasal spray have such a small amount of actual steroid, they not at the immunosuppression stage where they would put people at risk to actually catch a disease like coronavirus or COVID-19. So we must continue actually using our, our allergy medication so we can get relief of symptoms. And then there's the myth that people with allergies are more susceptible to COVID. So another myth as well too, because actually uh, one of the things that we know is that allergies might have a protective actual mechanism for COVID-19. Um, it seems to upregulate an enzyme that is actually um, helpful 
in, in COVID-19 as it has been found in some studies called ACE2, A-C-E-2. Um, so what I tell people is definitely uh, that is a myth. Oh, allergy, having allergies has got to have some benefit, right? Um, and then the Correct. other myth that, <laughs> that people using inhalers should stop using them. What do you say to that? So again, asthma is going to be very important that we optimally manage it because asthma or any respiratory disease such or lung disease such as COPD or emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma is going to put people at higher risk for COVID-19 because it's a respiratory virus. So we need to optimize asthma management, and that means taking your inhalers regularly. This is not the time to go off your inhalers. Okay, so let's say that we have determined our coughs are not coronavirus, but they actually are seasonal allergies. You've sent us some tips for managing all of them, and those tips are keep taking your allergy medications, sleep with windows closed, shower and change clothes after outdoor activity, Check pollen levels and avoid outdoors when levels are high and talk to your doctor. Um, so you've, you've already talked about keeping taking your allergy medications, uh, Dr. Mora, but also you say sleep with the windows closed. Why is that important? So it's spring season. Trees are out, grass is out as well too, and mold with all this beautiful rain in Chicago, mold is out as well too. So the reason to keep our windows Close is so that pollen doesn't come in all throughout the night, especially. So pollen actually pollinates around 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. So those are the highest pollen levels. And so when people sleep and the pollen is coming in because their windows are open, it hits their nose, coughing, stuffy nose, mucus can't run this way. They run into the sinuses, to the ears, post nasal dripping. So they wake up with all this phlegm, coughing, and really bad nasal congestion. So it's another mechanism of actually helping improve your environmental allergy control. Now, in April, we saw the, the Crawford smokestack demolition blanket the Little Village neighborhood with dust and debris. Um, here are some Little Village residents talking about how this affected their air quality. It's just um, environmental terrorism to me. Um, I mean, we're standing in a park and you can see behind me the facility. So you can see how closely one of the few green spaces that Little Village has can be directly affected. En mucha gente está enferma en nuestra comunidad, tiene problemas de asma, de los pulmones y coronavirus. También gente está enferma en las casas. Yo tengo un miembro de mi familia enfermo de coronavirus. Now that last person we heard from, she was saying that she has a member of her family who does have coronavirus. Dr. Mora, we've got about 20 seconds left, but how important are environmental factors in maintaining respiratory health? We have to keep the fight for clean air going. It's going to be important, especially in the midst of the respiratory COVID-19 pandemic. We have to actually talk to our legislator, push the Environmental Protection Agency to have stricter limits on particle pollution as well as ozone pollution as well, too because we have to fight for clean air for all. And it's people with lung disease, it's all of us. And the smokestack demolition actually proves how important it is to really not have done something like this in the middle, in the midst of a respiratory virus pandemic. So important. Okay, our thanks to Dr. Juanita Mora for joining us, thank you. You're welcome. A historic building in the West Ridge neighborhood faces the threat of demolition. Preservationists have a plan to save and relocate the structure, but as Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, the timeline is tight. The former Chicago Town and Tennis Club was built in the Tudor Revival style in the 1920s during that decade's tennis craze. The building later housed an Elks Club and, most recently, Unity Church. It's the work of prominent architects George and Philip Mayer, usually known for working in the prairie style. These great architects were artists and great masters at, at their building trade and their design skills. I would call it a very rare example, perhaps, of the work of George and Philip Mayer, which would make it more important to protect. Last year, the building was purchased by Misericordia, a home for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities right across the street. In December, Misericordia applied for a permit to demolish the building as part of an expansion project. But Preservation Chicago's proposed moving the structure 250 feet to the south to serve as the field house of Emerson Park, which is adjacent to the property on land that once belonged to the tennis club. 
The current field house is a, is a former comfort station and restroom, uh, and it's got a tiny little community room and a tinier office. So this would be an opportunity to expand programs. But it's not clear if preservationists will be able to come up with the estimated $1.5 million needed to move the building. They're counting on contributions from Ms. Recordia and from the Park District. So far, they haven't made any commitments. Whether the building is demolished or relocated, Ms. Recordia plans to build new housing on the site to help address a big backlog. In a statement, the organization says, while we recognize the building is important to some, we would hope that people can respect and appreciate our efforts to provide residential opportunities to those deserving men and women who have been waiting patiently for years to call Ms. Recordia their home. Miller says he fully supports the organization's mission. But we'd really like to see uh, Misericordia uh, be a partner in this whole idea and really uh, unify and join people with disabilities that, that are uh, you know, part of their programs here uh, with people from the community. There's a hold on demolition that expires this coming Wednesday. Ms. Recordia says it's working toward tearing down the property in the near future. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And if preservationists can come up with the money to move the building, they'd have to do so by August 31st. 40th Ward Alderman Andre Vasquez told us he's been in conversations with the Park District about whether moving the building to Emerson Park is feasible and hopes to hear more soon. Up next, how big data, how big data and a supercomputer are being used to make predictions about the spread of COVID-19 in Chicago. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Researchers at Argonne National Laboratory, just west of Chicago, have been using a simulated model of the city, think SimCity on steroids, to illustrate the spread of COVID-19 under various scenarios. The highly sophisticated model is now being used to simulate what may happen now that the city is gradually reopening, depending on whether people follow the advice of health experts or not. Joining us now to tell us how the model works and what it shows is Charles Makel, an Argonne Distinguished Fellow who oversees the development of these epidemi epidemiological models. I practiced it and I get paid to talk on television. Hi, Charles. How are you? I, I'm doing great. Thank you. Great. So how do you create a simulation like this? Well, uh, we create a simulation by essentially uh, uh, modeling uh, each and every person in Chicago as a software agent and all the places that people go to during the course of their day to uh, that people interact uh, as that day goes on, agents in the model that is interact. And uh, infectious agents uh, have the possibility of transmitting, uh, you know, the spread of the virus to other people that they're engaged in similar activities at the same location all in a simulated world. So, uh, you know, we're calling it SimCity on steroids, but how much detail can you put into this model? Well, we can put quite a bit of detail uh, on uh, individuals uh, in terms of, uh, you know, where they live, for example, uh, like at a zip code level, uh, you know, age uh, and other socio-demographic characteristics which are, are we get from, you know, basically census data. So we don't have p actual data on actual people, but uh, when you add it up, it, what we have in the model is very uh, reflective of, you know, the actual uh, aggregate totals that are available uh, from the census data. And, and we can model individual behaviors of the agents as well. Okay, so what does the model forecast then in, in terms of Chicago being able to reopen and what happens if people follow the guidelines or if they don't? Yes, we did many different uh, what we call scenarios or simulation runs. We did thousands of them in which we varied the, the assumptions that we used in each simulation. Uh, one of the uh, assumptions we varied were, were the opening dates, May 1st, June 1st, July 1st, and, and even later. Um, the other assumption that we varied are, uh, is how people uh, adhere to protective behaviors, the social distancing, the mask wearing. Th those behaviors effectively reduce the transmission, you know, between from infected people to uh, susceptible people in the model. 
And so uh, from comparison of these various scenarios and, and runs that we did, we, we, we showed that uh, the protective behaviors are very critically important for uh, at, at least keeping the, the infection rate and new cases down to, to, to kind of a plateaued level. Uh, that says and a lot. It, has, has the city asked you uh, to model the impact, though, of these recent mass protests uh, that we've seen in the city? Uh, well, we're taking upon ourselves to uh, do simulations that are more fine-grained detail, like you're, you're, you're describing uh, with the protests, to see if, let's say, 100,000 people uh, who were, you know, in the protest uh, were and increased levels of contact that they had uh, uh, with certain assumptions about whether people were wearing masks or not. We're, we're undertaking that run to see what the effects could possibly be. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're also, you're using the Theta supercomputer at Argon to do this, and you can run simulations for uh, a virtual year. How much computing power does it take to run that, and, and how long does it take to get results back? Well, it takes uh, an enormous amount of computing power uh, because really what we do is, we estimate so-called model parameters uh, from the actual uh, data that were, was coming in every day. And to do that process over and over again, like in an iterative manner, to get a good fit, so to speak, of the model to reality, takes uh, uh, you know thousands of processors operating over a period of about 30 hours to do a single, what we call calibration run. And then once we have the parameters calibrated, we do another set of runs that simulates, uh, you know, all everybody in Chicago, basically the 2.7 million people in Chicago going to the 1.2 million places in Chicago over a period of 8,760 hours, which are uh, uh, constitute a year. Okay, and we've got just a few seconds left, but you know, you continually revise and improve the model. Um, how much is it, has it changed as you learn uh, about the spread of the virus and people's behavior right now? Well, it's, it's changed quite a bit. And what we're able to do is to change the model in a way that keeps up with the questions that decision makers are asking. You know, before the, the pandemic grew to these proportions, People were looking forward, under, trying to understand how big will the peak be? When will the peak occur? And then how can we flatten the curve? Then there were a different set of questions after the stay-at-home order came into effect and people actually did stay home. And then now we're going through this phase of uh, the reopening. So there's many questions uh, and lots of pertaining changes. to what the effect of the reopening. Right, lots more changes to come, I'm sure. Our thanks to yeah. Charles Nagel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. We're back with more right after this. The Patrick and Shirley Ryan Grant for Creativity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship makes possible stories that enrich lives and inspire our communities. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who joins us from Mason Park in North Suburban Evanston, Paris. Yeah, Brandis, we're joined now by Camone Hendricks. She is the CEO and founder of the group Evanston President Future. It's a group that, among other things, works with uh, teen mothers and plans community events like next week's Juneteenth Parade. Thanks for being out here with us. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, Juneteenth, June 19th. Uh, remind us why that date is so important. Well, that date is important for a few reasons. You know, when Abraham Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation, which was supposed to free all of the slaves in the United States, it was not until about two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation on June 19, 1865, that Union soldiers had to march down to Texas, to Galveston, to Galveston Texas, and spread the news that the enslaved people were now free. And they did things like um, wrote articles about it, posted um, 
the uh, general order number three in different areas in the community so that all the enslaved people know, knew that they were free. And this was a really big community effort. It was something that, you know, took place because of black activists, because of white allies. And, and you know, it, it, it took a big effort for the this law that has been passed for two and a half years now to finally be enforced in Texas, which was one of the most rebellious states. And it's important because it's really America's true freedom day. July 4th, 1776, I believe it was, everyone was not free then. So what are we really celebrating that day as black people? So, you know, and it's, you know, it's pretty much the only celebration in America that commemorates it as the way it is, freedom delayed. So June 19th, uh, or, or the, the real date of freedom for all Americans. Right. And tell us what um, Evanston and what you plan to do here in Evanston on Juneteenth. So, you know, we were initially planning a very large parade. Um, I wanted to be as big as the 4th of July parade here in Evanston, but due to the pandemic, we had to um, switch it to a virtual parade. And we're going to uh, do several things. So on June 19th, we're going to have a virtual celebration that will have a lot of speakers, a lot of um, musical performances, a lot of dancers, a lot of really artistic creativity, and you know us being able to express ourselves as a community in the support of the Black community in Evanston and Freedom Day is Juneteenth. Then the next day, we're also going to have a community play reading of a really great play call, called Day of Absence, and it's uh, directed by Tim Rose, who is the artistic director of um, Fleetwood Jordan Theater right here in Evanston and then the following week we're gonna have a car parade on June 27th so I pulled together multiple efforts in order to really give the community a chance to learn what Juneteenth is because there's a lot of people that still don't know what it is and um, we're also going to have a few pop-up shops. I am collaborating with a lot of Evanston Black-owned businesses to um, participate in Juneteenth, and um, it's going to be great. We're going to celebrate the whole month of June. And I'm assuming in, in future years you'll probably want to have a, a real outdoor Juneteenth parade like you intended to have this year. Um, do you see parallels to what's happening right now uh, between Juneteenth and right now? Um, well, yeah, you know, to me, you know, black people as a whole, we are still fighting for real freedom. You know, Juneteenth happened two and a half years after a law passed. You know, to this day, we are still going through things like mass incarceration. The fact that, you know, our prisons are, you know, predominantly um, filled with black and brown people. You know, we are still having incidents like George, George uh, Floyd and, you know, a number of names. The list goes on where police are killing our people. So in a sense, it's very relevant because we're still fighting for our freedom. In, in Evanston, we spoke with the mayor earlier. Uh, there's a fund for reparations mm -hmm. uh, that could be as much as $10 million. How significant is that for you as an Evanston resident? Oh, my God, that's extremely significant. When um, Alderman Robin Ruth Simmons um, started this movement, I was so excited that, you know, there is a real effort behind it and that the city council passed it. She's been doing an amazing job pushing reparations, and I can't wait to see what happens with it. All right, Kimon Hendricks, thank you so much for joining. Best thank of you. luck with all your Absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. And Brandis will be back to wrap things up in just a bit, but now we toss it back to you. Month-long celebration of Juneteenth, Paris. Thank you. 141 years ago, a local club formed to support good government and a third term for President Ulysses S. Grant. Grant did not get that nomination, but the Union League Club of Chicago still welcomes presidents and dignitaries and explores public policy. It's also home to a massive art collection that includes a Monet and a Passel of Pashkis. Tonight's virtual tour visits a private club with a public focus and an eye for artwork. Here's arts producer Mark Vitale. The walls are filled with early American artwork, Depression-era oil paintings like Our Daily Bread, dramatic vistas of Yosemite Valley, and this view of Garfield Park painted more than a century ago. There's also contemporary work, including new acquisition, Back of the Bus for Now, by local artist David Anthony Geary, a 1990s holographic work by Ed Paschke, and this playful, windy cityscape by Roger Brown. The club was founded in 1879. The collection itself, the members from the first day of its inception, decided that culture was key, key for the future. Many of the members were distinguished individuals in Chicago that really set the foundation for the beauty of our city. Members included Daniel Burnham and Louis Sullivan. 
but like many clubs of the era, it was slow to welcome Jews, blacks, and women into the ranks. We have a saying that women were on the walls before they were in the halls. And that means, as we know, many clubs and universities were divided by sex. Before women were officially members here, we had art by female artists from the early 1900s. There is art everywhere, and absolutely the best collection of art of any private club, I would say, in the world, in breadth and in quality. Their most famous work is Monet's Apple Trees in Blossom, worth millions. It's currently on loan to an art exhibition in Germany. We purchased it back in 1895. At that time, Claude Monet was still alive. So when we purchased this work of art, it was a contemporary work of art. There are more than 700 works in a collection that continues to grow, even as the club suspended operations during the pandemic. The Union League Club is doing well, considering the circumstances. We have been around for over 140 years. We've lived through so many other turbulent times. And we continue not only to collect, but we also exhibit emerging artists. And so we have this great history right on our walls and also an exemplar of great beauty and what one can achieve. Culture helps us to become better people. It inspires us to do better things. And that's really, I think, what the Union League Club is all about. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The Union League Club reopened this week with limited services for small groups of members. They hope to resume public tours of their art collection later this year. If COVID-19 hasn't canceled events, it's certainly changed how they're being held. And the National Museum of Mexican Art's 17th annual Queer Prom is no different. Tomorrow, the dance is going virtual. For our second installment of WTTW's Chicago Portrait Series, we focused on one of the event's performers, Milani Ninja. So my name is Milani Ninja, and I am at the National Museum of Mexican Fine Arts getting ready for Queer Prom. I have been part of this for several years, and I am excited that I am back at it again. It's like prom, but it's more targeted towards individuals who are LGBT. So it's a space where, you know, youth who don't feel comfortable maybe going to their own prom or maybe people who haven't attended their own prom can attend this queer prom because we try to be as inclusive as possible and just have a fun night, performances, food. But this year it's a little bit different. We're going virtual um, just for everyone's safety. We want, we're going to be going on Zoom. It takes like about two hours minimum for us to get ready because I am a drag queen. Like I have to put other things together again and that takes about another hour because then you have to, have to do the nails, the lashes, the body. Like when I took, when people ask me my gender pronouns, I always say when I'm in drag, when I am the legendary Melanie Ninja, I always tell them, like, you have to refer me as her and she pronouns. Out of drag, you can call me he or she, and I approve this message. Well, you want it to be extra. True. <laughs> like, a lot of people don't understand how powerful us drag queen performers and transgender women are in our community. Because it was Marsha P. Johnson, a black transgender woman, who threw the first brick and started the Stolen Riots. And because of her, because of people of color, is the reason why we're all sitting here talking about this. We've come a long way, um, but there's still a long way to go, you know? So even in Latino culture, you know, spe speaking personally, there's still some, you know, struggles with identity acceptance in our own community. So that, having it be here in the National Museum of Mexican Art is such a big statement because the National Museum of Mexican Art is such a big um, organization in our, in our community. So when the, when the museum supports it, a lot of people who attend the museum see that message too. And I hope that impacts them. Just see the support from the museum so you kind of feel that this is a, a good space to be at. <laughs> Okay, now, 
Let's work. The museum's queer prom takes place via Zoom tomorrow at 8 p.m. and is for high schoolers only. Teens can find more information on our website if they're interested in registering and attending the virtual event. And we're joined by Paris Schutz again, who spent the day reporting in Evanston. But Paris, of course, you've been reporting in other communities all week amid the protests and the unrest. What was it that stuck with you the most about police community relations this week? Well, Brandis, it's been known for a long time that there is an issue of trust between police and certain communities. You know, residents don't trust the police. They don't come forward to talk to the police, and that's why police have such a problem solving crimes. The clearance rate is so low. And we spoke with a, a successful business owner in North Lawndale, a pharmacist whose store was untouched by any property damage early last week. And he said to us, I don't go to the police. I go directly to the source because they won't respect me if I go to the police. That tells me the issue of trust in many communities is huge and police have almost no foothold in some communities. So uh, Brandis, uh, there's so much to digest. What was, what was the thing that stood out to you most this week? You know, the big story for me this week, I think, was obviously the special edition of Chicago Tonight that we ran on Monday, Peace and Justice, um, you know, where we had a host of, you know, black leaders and experts um, and families uh, sharing their stories and talking about potential solutions, where we've been um, and where we hope to go. And, you know, on that note, Paris, WTT and WFMT released a statement today about racism. The statement reads in part, quote, this has been a painful time for the black community, for our city and for our country. It is moments like these that compel us to sharpen our focus on how we use our public media platform to serve our diverse community and to be clear about our values. We condemn racism in all forms and across all sectors of society. You can read that complete statement at WTTW.com statement. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us live tomorrow night for the Week in Review. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Stay safe. Enjoy this beautiful weather. And we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud of its partners named Illinois Leading Lawyers by the Law Bulletin Publishing Company of Chicago.